Isn't that what it's about? Blocking out all of the distractions during Christmas and making room in our hearts for Jesus alone. Come on, let's share our love and appreciation to Raveno, bringing a new song as a gift to you on this Christmas season. Wonderful. Thank you, Rav. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. So good to see all of you as we remember and honor Jesus when he came to this earth, born as a baby. Wonderful to see those of you who are brand new in our church. Some of you haven't seen in a while. Welcome back home. And those who are most important in the room today, all of our children. If you were a child underneath the age of 12, would you let me know you're here? Would you just raise your hand? Come on, church family. Let's show our love and excitement. We're so glad that you're with us today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Matthew chapter 2 in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 2. I'm glad that you're here for the finale of our Christmas series message. In week one, we discovered the name of Jesus as being Savior of the world. If you believe that Jesus is the only one that can save you from your sins, say, I believe. Then we discovered that Jesus is the divine Son of God. If you believe that to be true, say, I believe. And then last week we discovered Jesus as master and king. If you believe that Jesus is Lord over every area of your life, say, I believe. And today we're going to discover another name, another attribute of Jesus, that he is the light of the world. When we look at the Christmas story, you can't tell the Christmas story without talking about lights. Like the first light you may think of is which one? Maybe the bright star, right? What was the purpose of the bright star in the Christmas story? It was to bring people to Jesus. Let's look in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, it says, When they, talking about the wise men, they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great, what? Joy. They were happy and excited. It says, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. So imagine you're one of the wise men, and for days or weeks, you had just been heard the news from an angel that a, a star would be in the sky. It would be a phenomenon. It was so bright. Maybe you could even see it during the day. And you were traveling in the desert, riding your camel with great excitement and joy. You were filled with a lot of happiness because what was promised in the Old Testament was now coming true in your lifetime. And you were going to be the first eyewitness to see the King, the Messiah. You didn't know it would be in the form of a baby, but you knew the star would lead to the king. And so they finally get to the place, that, that manger, that, that place, and they, they went in and they gave the gifts. And then they gave their hearts as they knelt down and worshipped Jesus. They got to see it and they were so excited about seeing Jesus. And what I love about this story is that this star really led to a brighter light. And that brighter light, his name was Jesus. I love the the painting that was done by the artist Matthias Stomer in 1632 because it, it depicts the, the Jesus as being not a reflection of light, but as a, a true light. that The light came from him and lit up everybody and everything else. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, the glory of God it says that the sun is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of God himself. When people looked upon Jesus, they saw God the Father. There was no difference. Everything of God, all of his character and nature, all of his attributes, the sum of all of this is the glory of God. And it was all fulfilled in the body of Jesus, who was fully man, but he was also fully God. Remember 400 years of silence and darkness between one of the last prophecies that unto us a child would be born, son would be given, Emmanuel, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, that all come true in this moment. And Jesus was born as the light of the world. Even one of Jesus' closest disciples and friends, John would write about him in his gospel. And he started, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the Word was God. 
but he started it in the beginning. I imagine as he was writing down these words, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, he was reminded of how the Bible got started, right? Creation. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in verse 3, there was darkness that covered the earth. And God said, let there be what? Light. And the light was good. And so John is remembering the creation of the world, but now he's seeing God who is being born into the world. And it's in the beginning, and Jesus had always existed, but now he's being born. In verse 4 it says, in him was life, and that life was the what? The light of men. He's our light. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Some of you are here today, and you're in darkness. You're struggling, or maybe you're confused of who Jesus is. You don't understand. You can't comprehend it. But I believe the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God and being in His presence, you're going to clearly understand who Jesus is. And here's the most important thing I don't want you to forget, that what is in darkness must come to light. What is in darkness must come to light. And the good news is that Jesus has come as the light of the world And he has come to bring light on four different areas. So if you're keeping notes, the first area that Jesus brings light is to community. Jesus brings light to community. When Jesus came to this earth to fulfill his mission to seek and save the lost, he did it through discipleship. That was his divine method. He belonged to a small group. For three years, he poured his life into his friends. Twelve guys. He shared with them. He, He taught them how to pray. They went on long journeys together, hiking together. At night, they would meet around a campfire. Remember, this is before they had electricity. And they got to spend time in conversation and fellowship. But Jesus was the light. Jesus takes our friendship, and he, when he is at the center, he blesses it, and it becomes supernatural fellowship. Recently, I, along with some of our small group leaders, invited the men in our small group out for a camp out. And it was cold, and we were around the campfire, but there was about 25 of us, so we couldn't all fit around the the fire pit. So our circle got really big, and we were trying to eat. We were trying to talk to each other, but we couldn't see each other. It was a cloudy night. It was so dark. And then one of the guys, out of his backpack, he, he pulled this out. We were like, what is that? He said, it's a light. And he kind of folded it. It unfolded it and it just like filled up with air all on its own. He said it didn't have, didn't require batteries because of the sun. It was solar powered. And, and so he, he turned it on and, and he put it down right in the middle. Immediately everybody could see each other. The light, we could see each other's eyes and their facial expressions. And the dynamics of our relationship and conversation changed. We laughed louder. We were able to converse and And communicate better. And this is what happens when Jesus is at the center. He brings the light. In fact, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. When there is sin, the temptation is to hide. To hide in darkness. That's what Adam and Eve did. They were in the garden, but they sinned, and then they withdrew. They hid from God. And that's what happens. When you are in sin, when you're in in, in darkness, you want to isolate yourself. But you were created to glorify God, to have relationship with Jesus. You were created for community. Not to be by yourself or isolate yourself. And sometimes Christmas season can be a difficult season. And you might want to withdraw and be alone. I'm glad that you came to church with your church family. That you are discovering and remembering and honoring who Jesus is. But Jesus wants you to have wonderful Christian brothers and sisters who can bless you. That you can spiritually grow with. And this is why my greatest hope and desire is that you would belong to a small group. In fact, if you don't belong to a small group, my hope is that you would consider making it a New Year's resolution to belong to a small group next year. So first, Jesus brings light to community. Second, Jesus brings light to the chaos. Dark days get darker when you're by yourself. 
when you have a trial, when you go through a storm and things are difficult and they don't make sense, you can get afraid, right? But when Jesus is there, it says that perfect love dries out the fear. It pushes away the darkness. But let's face it, we all experience trials. It's, it's, Jesus said it. We would face trials, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, last night while we were having our Christmas service just like now, and I was sharing the good news of Jesus, sometimes it's easier to, to share hope and that everything's going to be okay during difficult times when things are going good, right? But when you're in that storm, when you're in that trial, that's when the true test comes. And so while last night, while I was sharing the Christmas message, do you know what was going on at my house? Would you like to see what was going on in my house? I'll show you a picture or actually a video. This is what happened last night during church at our house. A pipe burst and there was about two inches of water on the floor. Now, before Karen emails me, we did wrap our pipes. (laughs) But stuff still happens. Even when you prepare and you do everything you can, it still can happen, right? And so until late last night, we had to clean up the mess. We had to bring out the fans. We had to mop. We had to push out all of the water. And the whole time I'm thinking, wow, we were supposed to have a good Christmas Eve kind of dinner after service. And and here we are cleaning up the mess with our family and a few friends. And it was during that difficult time when I had a mop in my hand. I said, Lord, you got to help me on this one because I'm going to be preaching tomorrow. And uh, this is an opportunity to model what I preach. So help me have a good attitude. Thank you, Lord, for this trial. I know joy comes. Thank you for the cloak of humility, Lord. Thank you that you bring light onto chaos. And uh, But you know what happened? I was praying. I was like, you know what? This is tough, but we got our family And Jesus is still on the throne. Amen. And you may be here today and you're struggling because you're under financial pressure. There may be uncertainty about your future or unresolved conflict with a family member. Or you may be in a real physical battle and life is not always easy. Sometimes it can be a struggle and it can be a real battle. Dark days get darker on their own, but they get brighter when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. He's the anchor. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. The word of God is like a lamp, right? It's like a lamp. The word of God, when you immerse yourself, abide with the Lord daily, the Holy Spirit brings back the scripture as a light to your path, those dark paths, because darkness is, has no, there's no room for darkness when there is light. And that's what the Lord does. And so you may be here discouraged, worried, anxious. I ask you to go to the Lord and have faith in God. And with all thanksgiving and prayer and supplication, go to the Lord. The Bible says in Philippians 4 that the supernatural peace of God will come and guard your heart and mind. Through Jesus, you can have supernatural peace. Even during difficult times and chaotic times, Jesus, the gift giver, can give supernatural joy during the most difficult of times. So God brings light to community. He brings light second to what? To the chaos. Third, Jesus brings light to the city. How does Jesus bring light to the city? Think about it. It's like there's a spiritual darkness in the world. Jesus came as a light of the world. But he looks at all of his followers and his children. And I want us to read Matthew chapter 5 because this is Jesus talking about you. He's alive. The word of God is living. Amen. And he says... You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. He says, hey, you are created also to be a light, and I don't want you to be hidden where no one can see you. I want you to be bold. I want you to be up front. I want other people to see you as the light, as a reflection of me. So he says, put it on a lampstand, and it gives a light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work. Your good work. So not only by your word do we witness about who Jesus is and the gospel and what he's done in our life, but also by our good works, how we show generosity and patience when we're tempted to get short. 
when we're kind and we're gentle and we're loving by these works, look what happens. It says, they will glorify your Father in heaven. All it takes is one tiny light to make a big difference when there is darkness. And let's face it, we live in a dark world, don't we? There is spiritual darkness. People are in pain. They don't have hope. When they don't have a relationship with Jesus and they don't know the love of God, it can be a dark time. And so Jesus has called us out as a church. He has called you out to witness, to be bold about who Jesus is, but also to reflect his character and nature through your works. And when you do that, you know what happens? You are a light. Would you do me a favor? Everybody take out your phone, all right? And I want you, as we put the bright lights in this room up, all the lights, go to your flashlight, and I want you to shine your light, all right? Shine the light. We're here at church, and it's bright, right? we got all kinds of lights all over the place, and yeah, it makes maybe a little difference. But watch what happens when our lights shine in darkness. You see what happens? Our lights get brighter, right? Because that's the purpose of light. It's to shine, not in where it's bright, but to shine in darkness. Can you imagine if all of our lights were shining? This is our opportunity, church family, to light up our city, to love our city through our words, our good works. Imagine if we shined brightly and boldly at every school campus, every workplace, every neighborhood, every hospital, every school, all for the glory of God. This is our opportunity. Jesus has called us to be the light of the world. Amen? And so may we not shine brightly just at church, but let's go where darkness is at. Hey, some of you are going to be around the Christmas table tomorrow with your family. And some of your family members don't know Jesus. They don't know this light. Can I challenge you? Before you ever open up the presents, this is a tradition in our family. We open up the Bible and we read the entire chapter of, of Luke chapter 2. And we remember Jesus and we pray. And so I want to encourage you to do that and to share the gospel, to be bold and to share what Jesus has done in your life. You can go ahead and put away your phones. So Jesus gives light first to the community. Second, Jesus gives light to what? The chaos. Third, Jesus gives light where? To the city. But there's a fourth area that Jesus gives light, and that is to your conscience. That's your mind. That's what's inside of you that knows what is right and what is wrong. And Jesus gives light to you. He doesn't want you to remain in darkness. You have a choice. Are you going to remain in darkness or walk into the light? When you have knowledge of who Jesus is and you have understanding, you are responsible for what you know. But the enemy is going to try to tempt you. He's going to try to confuse you about who Jesus is. It's kind of like this. At the very beginning of every Christmas season, we start to get excited, start to play the music, start to watch the movies, right? And then someone says, hey, it's time to put up the Christmas lights. So you get the box out of the attic or in the garage. How many of you have ever done this? When you, you open up that box and get the Christmas lights and you pull out the lights and it looks like this. Anybody ever been there? What are you tempted to do? Like throw it out and buy new lights, right? But some of you are a little persistent. You're like me. You're a little bit frugal. You're like, I got, they work. We're going to have to figure this out. And so, and, and so you start to try to untangle the mess, and it just gets more frustrating, and it's confusing. And this is what happens in your mind. This is what happens in your conscience. When you are in darkness, the enemy brings shame and condemnation and confusion of who Jesus is. Did he really die on the cross? Is he really alive? Does he really have hope and love for you? That's what the enemy does in darkness. And Jesus came not to bring confusion, but clarity, to bring light into your mind and in your conscience, amen, about who Jesus is. And that's what he's done. And that's what even today as we are in his presence talking about the Christmas story and focusing on who Jesus is, is the greatest gift, greater than any gift under a tree, is the gift of Jesus who died on a tree on the cross. Why did he do that? Well, the gospel says in John 
chapter 3, starting in verse 16. You're familiar with the first verse, but lean in on the verses that follow. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and they have been done in God. So if you are in darkness, if you have secret sins that you're hiding, no, you can't hide it before the Lord, but you're here and he's patient. He has a purpose. He's drawn you to his presence. He will convict you of your sin. It doesn't feel comfortable. The temptation will be to hide, to stay in darkness. But if you do that, the path is eternal destruction, separation. Jesus came to this world to save you from your sin, to save you from hell, to save you from eternal separation because he loves you. But it's only when you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, confess, repent of your sins and turn to God will you walk in light. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God to cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He rose from the grave. He's alive forevermore. His word is alive. He is here today, and he wants to save you from your sins. He wants to bring light to every dark area. Will you bow your heads? Just in your own words, would you thank Jesus for being the light? Would you thank him for being the greatest gift? Just thank him. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, who you came to this earth. You offered up yourself. You laid down your life. It wasn't taken from you because of your great love for us that you died on the cross. And even now, I pray that you would illuminate this truth, that you would shine your light on every area of our life. Those things that we do because we love sin and we go back over and over, they're dark. This is the moment for you to confess them. Lord, I pray that you would place in us a, not a worldly sorrow, but a godly sorrow and a grief and a mourning over sin because you hate darkness. But Lord, you provided a way out through your light. And so I pray that all of us would would confess those areas where we've missed the mark. Some of you are here today with heads bowed and you'd acknowledge that you are in darkness. You are, your lives are not right with God. You don't have a personal relationship with Jesus and you're convicted of your sin, not to be condemned or to be shamed, but so you can be saved. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the only way, the only person who can save you from your sin. And I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus, to make a life-changing decision, to pray, to confess Jesus as the Son of the living God, to confess and repent of your sin and turn to God. I want to pray with you. So I'm going to count to three. And if you're here today, whether you're young or old, I'm going to ask that you would boldly lift your hand. And the greatest gift you could receive this Christmas of 2022 is the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He desires the best for you. He loves you. And so all over this room, would you boldly lift your hand when I count to three, saying, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I confess him as the son of the living God, the only one who can save me from my sin. One, two, three. Would you lift up your hand all over this room? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. A whole family here on the second row. Small group leaders, can you please come forward? We want to connect with you. But I want to seize this moment. And will you bow your head? And would everyone repeat this prayer sincerely in their heart? Jesus, say his name out loud. Jesus, 
Thank you for dying on the sin, on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. I can't save myself. So I put my trust in you, Jesus. Thank you for raising from the dead, changing my life. And from this moment on, I want to follow after you. Lord, I pray in this moment that you brought great light to our conscience, that you would cleanse our minds and our heart from every stronghold of sin, that we would choose as families, as men, as women, as children to follow after you. I pray that you would give them a hunger for your word of God, for Christian fellowship from this moment on. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I'm going to ask that those of you who are here today that say, hey, I, I'm here and I'm, this is just kind of a hard season. I'm, I'm feeling alone or discouraged. I'm in the middle of the chaos and I could just use some encouragement and hope. Would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you all over this room. Thank you. If you're around someone who's raised their hand, can you put your hand on their shoulder? This is our opportunity as a church family to carry each other's burdens. Lord, I thank you for our friends that are here that are feeling discouraged, worried, anxious. I pray that they would be overwhelmed with your presence of love and a church family that is for them. Remind them that you're, they're not alone, that you are with them. And I pray that you would give light, that you would give wisdom from above, clarity, God, that you, would give, that you are the provider, our healer. And so we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.